you to the Devere Institute for the opportunity to be with you tonight and to be part of this panel and important discussion at this critical time in Canadian history. I've been involved in education and policy development related to the intersection and palliative care made for the past six years since the Carter case in 2015. I've written extensively and spoken nationally and internationally on this topic, most recently as an expert witness for the Parliamentary Committee studying Bill C-7 in both the House of Commons and the Senate. During my remarks this evening, I'll cover four key objectives. The first is to review what palliative care is, then what MAID is, provide a brief overview of the current MAID legislation under Bill C-14 and the changes that are proposed under Bill C-7, and discuss the various aspects of these and their impact on palliative care. To start with, what is palliative care? Palliative care is care focused on improving the quality of life and symptom management for those living with life-threatening conditions and their families. It does not intentionally end life and is internationally recognized as a practice distinct from MAID. Both the World Health Organization and the International Association for Hospice Palliative Care definitions of palliative care speak to three core components. The first is a core philosophy that affirms life, that sees dying as a normal process and focus on living well until natural death. The second is the intention of palliative care to alleviate suffering, to enhance dignity and to improve quality of life. The third is the approach of palliative care, focusing on impeccable symptom assessment and management and supportive care for the whole person, including physical, psychosocial, emotional and spiritual issues. Evidence shows that early access to quality palliative care improves a person's quality of life, enhances their well-being, reduces anxiety, improves satisfaction with care, and in some cases, even helps people to live longer. Despite all of this, the unfortunate reality in Canada is that many Canadians do not have access to the high quality palliative care that they need and want. Our best understanding is that only approximately 30% of Canadians have access to any form of palliative care, of course, with large regional variation. Some of our rural remote communities have almost no palliative care. And overall, only about 15% of Canadians have access to specialist palliative care, which is needed to manage more complex situations. Palliative care has not been deemed a right under the Canada Healthcare Act, and there is therefore no formal obligation to ensure it is adequately funded and accessible at a provincial level. Second, I'd like to talk about what is MAID. In Canada, we have legalized both euthanasia and assisted suicide and refer to them under the banner of medical assistance in dying or MAID. In MAID, death is intentionally caused by administration of a lethal dose of drug. Death is not due to the underlying illness. In assisted suicide, a doctor or nurse practitioner writes the prescription for the lethal drug and the patient takes the drug him or herself. In euthanasia, the doctor or nurse practitioner directly administers the lethal dose of drug that ends a person's life, often in Canada via an intravenous route. The overwhelming majority of cases of MAID in Canada are euthanasia. Very few people choose to administer the medication themselves, the drug themselves, excuse me. So MAID is not palliative care. And another important concept that we don't have a lot of time to go into detail today, MAID is also not the same thing as discontinuing or foregoing life prolonging medical treatments such as antibiotics, dialysis, chemotherapy, when those treatments are felt to be futile or the burdens outweigh the benefits. Why do people request MAID? The primary reason that people request MAID and has been shown to be consistent internationally is due to emotional and psychological anguish. Most requests, requests for MAID are not due to uncontrolled physical symptoms such as pain or shortness of breath, but rather fear of dying, fear of having pain, worry about being a burden to others, and a desire for control. So far in Canada, we've seen about 20,000 made deaths since it was legalized up to the end of 2020. And the number of cases have been steadily rising each year and now account for about 2% of all deaths. Next, I'll give a brief overview of the development of made legislation in Canada 
that we've also heard a little bit about in the introduction and introductory remarks. So in 2015, we had the landmark Carter versus Canada case, where the Supreme Court of Canada struck down the criminal prohibition on homicide and assisting in suicide for the purposes of MAID. They then gave Parliament 18 months to develop the legislation. The resulting legislative response was what we now have as Bill C-14, which was enacted in June 2016. Bill C-14 allows both nurses and nurse sorry, physicians and nurse practitioners to administer MAID. They set out specific eligibility criteria and delineated standards for safeguards to, re to reduce harm. To be eligible, you have to have be at least 18 years of age and capable of making your own healthcare decisions. You have to be eligible for publicly funded healthcare in Canada, have a grievous and irremediable medical condition, death must be reasonably foreseeable, you must have a request that is shown to be voluntary and provide informed consent at the time of assessments as well as at the time of procedure. The safeguards included a mandatory 10-day reflection period, giving people time to change their mind, two independent witnesses, two independent assessors who determine eligibility, and the capacity again, as I mentioned above, serves here as well for a capacity at time of request and time of procedure. In this brief talk today, we don't have time to review information regarding the adequacy of safeguards or the monitoring for MAID and how well they've been working under the spill C-14, but I'm sure that Dr. Yarrow Kodalik will address some of that in his talk tomorrow night. And if you have further interest in this discussion, in this issue. My colleagues and I published a paper in the World Medical Journal in April 2020, which reviews some of the concerns with the safeguards around MAID. Important to note is that under Bill C-14, MAID was made a healthcare right under the Canada Health Act and thereby had to be publicly funded and accessible coast to coast. As I described earlier, there is no similar right to access palliative care or other supports needed for living, such as disability supports or home care. Then we come to 2019, where we have a court challenge in a Quebec lower court, Truchon and Gladue. These were Canadians with disabilities who were not dying, but wanted a right to access MAID. The judge in that court case ruled that the requirement for a reasonably foreseeable natural death for MAID was unconstitutional and tasked the government with addressing legislation to address it. There was a large outcry from the disability community with over 90 disability rights organizations and hundreds of concerned doctors writing open letters advocating for the government to appeal the decision. The government did not. And just a note that this is very unusual to let a lower court ruling from one province dictate changes in federal legislation. The government's response to the Truchon ruling rather than appeal was to put forward Bill C-7 which removed the criterion for reasonably foreseeable death, but goes well beyond that by removing safeguards that had felt to be important to protect vulnerable persons put in place under C-14. This bill was initially tabled in Parliament in February 2020, but after Parliament was prorogued, it had to be reintroduced in October 2020. The bill passed its third reading in the House of Commons in November and last week passed in Senate with a number of amendments put forward. The government responded to the Senate amendments last evening by agreeing to accept the eligibility for mental illness as a sole diagnosis through a sunset clause of 24 months instead of the Senate proposed clause of 18 months. And as we heard earlier, the debate started today in Parliament and we assume a coming vote will be in the, in the next few days. So what are the changes to made under Bill C-7? So of course it removes the requirement for the reasonably foreseeable natural death. And to do so, the government has created two tracks. The first track is similar to C-14 for those that have a reasonably foreseeable death. The second track is for those that do not and includes a person with a disability, chronic illness, and in 24 months, mental illness as a sole diagnosis. First under track one, additional safeguards were removed, including the 10 day reflection period, the removal of requirement for final consent, i.e. capacity at time of the procedure, and a reduction in the number of witnesses from two to one 
and that one witness can now be a paid healthcare worker. Under track two, they put in place a 90 day assessment period. They required that a physician be involved who's an expert in the underlying illness, but that physician does not have to be one of the two made assessors. And that a person has to be informed and offered other treatment options, but there's no requirement for treatments to have been tried or to even ensure that they're accessible to a person. This is also the same in track one, a person only has to be informed of their options available to them. But the stakes are seemingly higher when a person could have a readily treatable condition and years or decades left to live, but refuse what we would call the medical standard of care and ask for death instead. I know Dr. Quell will be speaking more about this, so I will leave track two for those without a reasonably foreseeable death for her to talk to you more about. Other countries who allow physician provided made outside the end of life context have treated it as a last resort when no other options for care remain. Law professors Mary Sharif and Trudeau Lemons and I recently published a paper which speaks to this impact, the impact of the legislation on the standard of medical care. In this legislation, we assert that patient choice and informed consent are dislodging the medical practice of standard of care and will make Canada the only country in the world to make made available as a first line therapeutic treatment. So how has all of this impacted palliative care? I'll only have time to touch on a few things tonight as uh, I was talking prior to the seminar that we could actually spend 90 minutes looking just at some of the implications for palliative care and its practice and provision. But I'll pick a few things to highlight. The first is that there's been ongoing confusion between maid and palliative care. I still have patients who come to see me in clinic, even last week, who think that maid is palliative care. They think that maid is providing comfort measures while they're dying. They don't understand that it's a lethal injection to immediately end their life. I think this confusion has been perpetuated by euphemistic language, as well as ongoing myths and misunderstandings about palliative care. Made language itself, medical assistance in dying, is confusing because that's what I do every day when I provide palliative care. We assist people much earlier in their illness trajectory, but, but certainly during the dying process and end of life care is a core component of palliative care. But we don't end someone's life or hasten their death. I think the government chose the term medical assistance in dying to make it more palatable. In fact, they did acknowledge that the term assisted suicide was stigmatizing and veered away from that. Maid and palliative care have been lumped together under the umbrella of end of life care, including by government bodies and ministries of health. Medical professionals themselves have described maid as, quote, just another tool in the end of life care basket. This seems to put maid on the same continuum as palliative care. However, I've already described how the key core philosophies, intention, and care provided in palliative care are very different than made. Made is not end of life care, but rather ending of life and goes against the core principles and philosophy of palliative care. National palliative care organizations, including the Canadian Society of Palliative Care Physicians and the Canadian Hospice and Palliative Care Association have advocated that these two distinct practices must be kept separate to avoid perpetuating the confusion. The myths that continue to be perpetuated about palliative care are that it already hastens death. Some people think that by giving opioids for pain or shortness of breath at the end of life that we speed things along. Or they wrongly equate the use of palliative sedation with maid. Even that was continued to be misconstrued in the recent Senate hearings. Opioids and other medications when used in palliative care are titrated carefully for effect and side effect, and they do not hasten death when used appropriately. Palliative sedation is a particular tool used by palliative specialists in very specific circumstances in the last days of a person's life if they have symptoms that are refractory to usual medical measures. It is to be done in consultation with a palliative specialist so that that physician can ensure that all the other options for symptom relief have been tried and exhausted and that palliative sedation is provided according to standardized guidelines with close monitoring 
and th for therapeutic effect and side effect, as we would with any medication. When used in this context, palliative sedation does not hasten death. What do we know about access to palliative care since the legalization of MATE? Well, the unfortunate reality is that we don't have robust data to draw specific conclusions, but we do have some limited data and anecdotal perspectives, which I will review. We've seen a lack of investment in palliative care resources and some existing resources for palliative care have been diminished. Even though the Supreme Court of Canada and the federal government said through the Carter case and the C-14 legislation that we needed to enhance and prioritize access to palliative care. In some jurisdictions, under the banner of end-of-life care, palliative care is also being used to fund MAID programs. For example, in Ontario, uh, MAID was placed under palliative and end-of-life care portfolio in local health regions. And in some cases, nurse practitioners in the hospice palliative care program were assigned to, to be involved in MAID provision using the funding for them to do their palliative care role, thereby effectively reducing already limited palliative care resources. In Quebec, we've seen that the number of physicians providing palliative care has dropped since legalization of MAID. Quebec Senator Julie Miville de Chen during the Senate testimonies stated, the reality is that medical assistance in dying has been available in Quebec since as early as 2015, but palliative care at home has failed to materialize. Yet the Quebec Act respecting end-of-life care reaffirms the right to receive palliative care in institutions or at home. The Association Québécoise des Soins Palliatifs estimates that 90% of Quebecers at the end of life do not have access to a home palliative care team to provide round-the-clock support. Is there any evidence that a lack of access to palliative care is impacting MAID requests? In their first annual report by Health Canada published in July 2020, they stated that 82% of those who receive MAID also access palliative care services and use this to conclude that requests for MAID are not necessarily being driven by lack of access to palliative care. However, the conclusions of this report have been called into question based on the inadequacies of their data to be able to make such interpretations. These were self-reports by MAID providers and lack specific meaningful information on both the quality or the quantity of palliative care and who it was provided by. Palliative care physician from British Columbia, Dr. Romaine Gallagher, looked at this Health Canada, Health Canada data more closely and made a different conclusion. In her recent article in Policy Options, she stated that a lack of palliative care is a failure in too many made requests and that an unacceptable number of people who requested made received little or no quality palliative care in the months before death. She pointed out how in the Health Canada report, it also shows that 854 people, almost 16% of people who got made had access to palliative care for less than two weeks prior to their life being ended. So she proposed that the trigger in those cases for referral to palliative care was likely the request for made. And that another 874 people, also around 16% of people received no palliative care at all. According to Dr. Gallagher, this should be considered a failure of our system as many of these people may have been suffering for months without access to quality palliative care. Another recent report by palliative care physician, Dr. Monroe in November, 2020, examined palliative care involvement in patients requesting MAID in their local region. And they also found it to be inadequate. In their study, 72.6% of patients had no community palliative care physician and 40% had no palliative care involvement prior to requesting MAID. Next, I'm gonna move on to palliative care and requests for hasten death and the potential impact of the 10 day, removal of the 10 day reflection period. Palliative care clinicians regularly hear requests or expressions of a desire to die or desire for hasten death. These are often expressions of grief, anger, loss and despair as a response to a devastating diagnosis or a change in condition. This lament is often a cry for help, but now we see this leading sometimes to a maid consult before palliative care has even been involved. Many times this desire to die goes away with support. Dr. Har Dr. Harvey Chachanoff's published work in psychiatry and palliative care demonstrates that the desire to die in the terminally ill 
fluctuates and often dissipates within two weeks. He told Parliament during the C7 hearings that the 10 day reflection period strikes an important balance, allowing me to be requested while protecting people who might change their minds and go on to live many weeks, months, or even years. The removal of the 10 day reflection period under Bill C7 means that a person could request MEAD and receive it on the same day with no opportunity to change their minds. In the most recent Health Canada report I spoke about earlier, in one year, 263 Canadians who had requested MEAD ended up withdrawing their request. Had the 10 day reflection period not been in place, 263 Canadians may have had their lives ended prematurely who might not otherwise. I have to say that I have a big worry about this, the impacts of this removal of the 10 days on our work in end of life care and palliative care. I'm worried that it's going to increase the moral distress that our palliative care clinicians are facing as they worry about patients who might be getting a wrongful death and feel helpless to do anything about it. I'm almost done. <laughs> uh, two more quick things to talk about. I want to talk about the push that's coming about for professional obligations on doctors to, about a duty to inform all patients about MEAD. As I referenced earlier, Bill C-7 places MEAD equal to the standard of medical care, even seemingly permissible as a first line treatment. And there is accordingly a strong push for doctors to bring it up as an option to all patients as a treatment for suffering. If this became a professional obligation on me by my regulatory college, that, that would mean I would have to suggest me to all of my patients in palliative care, every single one, or potentially risk disciplinary action or loss of license. I have many concerns with this. First, if a doctor offers, offers unsolicited maid as an option, this may be all that is needed to push a vulnerable person to pursue it. Patients take the recommendations of their doctor seriously. And my patients are already made vulnerable by facing a serious life-threatening diagnosis. The parliament heard many examples of Canadians who felt pressured to pursue MAID or who were directly told by a doctor they should consider MAID when they were not asking for it. And I know Dr. Coelho will be speaking further to this. Furthermore, since MAID is contrary to the core philosophy and goals of palliative care, I would be betraying my core professional values and role as a palliative care physician by having to suggest MAID. How could I maintain my professional integrity and identity as a palliative care physician and in good conscience be able to continue practicing palliative care? I know many other palliative care physicians who have told me they feel the same way. We have already experienced a number of doctors leaving palliative care practice and retiring early due to the pressures and moral distress around MAID. Where would this leave the future practice of palliative care if many more of us felt we had no choice but to leave palliative care practice? Lastly, there's a large push to provide MAID within all palliative care units and hospices across Canada, even though this is counter to the core philosophy and goals of palliative care. Hospices and palliative care units have been forced with losing funding, funding if they don't comply with this mandate. The most recent example of this is the Delta Hospice Society's Irene Thomas Hospice that was forced to close last month. Along with people who want MAID, there are also many people who want hospice palliative care at the end of their lives without fear that we are going to shorten their lives prematurely or provide MAID without their consent. So what does the future of palliative care look like under C7's expanded MAID regime? Unfortunately, many of us are worried. The reality is that the ability to provide palliative care true to the core goals and philosophy is becoming more difficult in Canada. We see decreased access to already scarce palliative care resources, not an increase. Even though 98% of people don't want to die by MAID. We see decreased access to safe spaces that can exclusively focus on providing authentic palliative care, such as hospices and dedicated palliative care units. We are at risk of losing palliative care professionals due to the increasing moral distress and burnout as the nature of our work is changing under MAID, and even more people may leave the practice of palliative care, especially if it becomes mandated that we have to recommend MAID to our patients. But we always like to be hopeful in palliative care. So I'm going to end on a positive note. We need your help 
to demand from government that palliative care is funded as an essential service under the Canada Health Act. We need to ensure that basic palliative care training is integrated into every healthcare professional's program. We need to ensure we uphold the integrity of palliative care by demanding from government that palliative care units and hospices can choose to operate without being forced to provide MAID. MAID can be provided anywhere, including in dedicated MAID facilities or units where people who are ethically and morally comfortable with this type of care can choose to work there without forcing others to participate. We need to get regulatory bodies to agree that MAID must be a patient initiated discussion and doctors must not be suggesting unsolicited, unsolicited MAID to vulnerable patients. And lastly, we urgently need conscience protection for healthcare professionals so that we are not forced to recommend death to our patients. Thank you.